All right, hello, <coughs> hello everybody. Welcome back. Uh, I've changed my shirt. <laughs> uh, not to be uh, an impressive dresser, but really to, uh, to help you to identify. You know when you get all these video clips and, and they all look the same? Because <laughs> the backdrop's the same. So I'm going to have a different shirt. So the red shirt here is part two, all right? And we're going to go into uh, all about our identity, the real identity of the Christian part two. And uh, we closed off on the new creation, and I want to pick up from there. And uh, there's a couple of, um, there's a pretty big slab of scripture I've put in from Colossians chapter 3 um, that I think will help us understand this. This, is, this. this part we're talking about now is really central to actually living out the Christian life the way God intended. Cup of coffee. It was water the first time, but it's coffee this time. All right, so therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation or she is a new creation or a new creature or a new species of being. The old has passed away. That's past tense. The old has passed and the new has come. So that old nature we're going to find in Scripture is dead. It identified with Jesus when he died, that nature died. Water baptism has significance in that way, in that it is identifying or confirming visually and experientially for us what is the core of the Christian life, which is why it is one of the two sacraments in the Christian church, the way we would approach it. It is because we're identifying with the fact that Jesus died and we died with him and in him. When he died, we died. And when he was raised from the dead, we rise from the water, affirming that we are a new creation. And that thinking is central to us walking in our identity. So the old nature is dead. It is therefore not something we have to kill. When Jesus died, it died with him. So the approach that we have to kill off an old nature isn't the right approach. It's not a biblical approach. It, it, it goes back to us trying to do in our own sincere efforts what God already did in Christ. Um, sometimes thoughts have come that try and convince us that that old man is still alive and that causes trouble for us, which is why there's a Bible reference that says that we should now reckon or consider the old nature as dead. Now let's have a look at Colossians 3. <clears throat> it's uh, There's a passage here, quite a passage, and um, I'm reading the NIV New UK version. You've got the notes, these verses in your notes here. It says, since then... You have been raised with Christ. So that's stating it as a fact, not you will be one day. This is not talking about when you, the final day of judgment, the return of the Lord, the, the, the um, going on to heaven. Um, it is talking about right now and it says you have been raised with Christ. And then since that is true, he then says, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So you can set your heart on something. You can attach your heart. You can focus your heart like you focus a camera. You can focus your heart. What are you to focus on? Heavenly things. The old phrase, you've probably heard it, you know, the person is of so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good. Um, I know what people are talking about when they say that because um, they're generally talking about nutty uh, kind of Christian people that that uh, don't live in the real world. They don't make sense. No need to live like that. But actually, that's not really true. It's not. It's not really possible to be so heavenly minded that you're of no earthly value. In fact, the more heavenly minded you are, the more of earthly value you will be because you will uh, walk in a way where you're bringing heaven's realities into earth's experience. So set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Now then set your mind on things above. Now your mind and your heart or your soul and your spirit are very close together. Even though they're not exactly the same thing, they, they, they mingle. And we're to do the same thing with both of them. In other words, focus 100% of your heart, your mind, everything about you 
set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died. Past tense. You died. That old nature, that died. And your life, which is the new life, is hidden with Christ in God. And the more we see of Christ, the more we see of our real life. There's a struggle there for many Christians because they don't tend to focus their hearts on the things of heaven. They're not so conscious of Jesus every day of their lives, but that is where their life is. So then they, they wander around and they live sometimes more or less like the rest of the world with their, wor with their eyes, of their heart fixed on worldly things. And not a wonder they lose their sense of identity because their identity is no longer there. It's now in Christ. So you died, your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Now, listen, put to death. So it's a choice we make. Put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And here's the things that belong to your earthly nature or fleshly nature. Sexual immorality. See, so many people will think, well, sexual immorality is, is, is that's the devil. You know, the devil made me do it. Um, that's, that's demonic influence. It's true that there is a demonic influence, but we uh, live still in the flesh. And so we have a responsibility not to walk according to that flesh, even though we live in it. But that is not disagreeing with the fact that our old nature is dead. Our old nature has passed. And he says, put to path, put to death things that belong to that nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust. Lust is not, lust is not sexual per se. Lust is, I want to have it now. Lust is, I want to eat it now. I want to go now. I'm going to lose my temper now. It is impetuous, demanding uh, in, in the instant moment. And it says, so that's also work of the flesh. Evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. When you want stuff for yourself. Because of these things, the wrath is going, oh, wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rid yourself of it. It's not part of your nature. But rid yourself of the habit of those two things go hand in hand. In other words, because you get angry, um, those emotions, those things whilst you're in the flesh are going to come. But that is not your real nature. That's the thing to understand. So put it off. Rid yourself of these things. Anger, rage, malice, getting somebody back, slander criticizing people. It's in the same bag. Filthy language from your lips. Don't lie to one another. All in the same bag. All the works of that fleshly nature. And then it says, don't do that since you have taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here, there's no Gentile, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, anything like that, slave free. It's Christ. Christ is all and Christ is in all. So you've taken off. See how he says that in past tense? You have taken off your old self. So it's a thing you do every day. But it, the reality is that the, 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 is the old nature has died. But it's a daily decision to put it off, to keep it off, instead of believing that that it still is who you are. And then you put on, here it says, the new nature. So you've got a new self, you've got a new nature, put it on. Walk in it. Think like it. Don't look at your life and think those old things, I've, I've you know, lo I'm angry, I've lost, um, I've lost, lost control or whatever, therefore that's the way, that isn't who you are anymore. You're a new creation in Christ and what the devil tries to do is utilize the flesh that you live in. And then when you don't put that off and you walk according to that, you, the, you start thinking that's who you are. And that's where defeat comes from all the time. So let's keep reading. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion. Clothe is something you put on. It's like an anointing. It's like a grace on your life 
that, but it is who you really are, but you still got to put it on. It's a bit like being royalty, you know. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen The Crown. Uh, that's a pretty good series. I've seen not, not all of it, but some of it. And there are processes that Elizabeth goes through as a young, uh, just become the queen. And she has to uh, deal with her sister in a certain way and deal with her husband in a certain way. And it's, it's obvious that there's a constant tension because she is by birthright, this person that is unlike any other, and she has responsibilities, but she still feels emotional and, uh, and, and, and has the same feelings as anybody else, obviously. So, so you see her overcoming in some situations, having to put on who she is now as royalty, uh, even though people won't like it, even though people might accuse her of being self-centered, even though she's now not allowing the natural feelings that she has to dominate her. So it's that kind of concept. You're now a child of God. It doesn't mean that you don't feel things. It means that you put on the nature of who you are. You accept that that is who you are. You think like that's who you are. You expect yourself to walk like God. You expect yourself to think like God. You expect yourself to hear from God. You expect yourself to love like God. And then when you fail at something, which you will, instead of saying, I'm bad, I'm a sinner, you say, all I did was allowed my thinking, I, I had my mind on the wrong thing, I, I accepted, I allowed the flesh person to dominate me, instead of putting on who I really am. You make the decision to put it on. The Holy Spirit is our helper, but we are responsible for our choices and our actions. I hope that brings some clarity to that. Let's, let's read a bit more here. So as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion. Clothe yourself, put on kindness. Just put it on, not put it on, fake it. Walk in it, it's who you are. But your mind and your heart have tremendous ability, power in determining how you walk. Put on humility, put on gentleness, put on patience. You don't feel like being patient, but that actually is your new nature. So you say, I'm just going to put that on. I'm going to keep putting, putting on that nature. And many, for many Christians, it's a new thought because they're so used to allowing the flesh person or the old nature to dominate them. Now, the old, actually, the old nature is dead, but to, to allow that flesh, the fact that we're living in the flesh to dominate them, that to think I can be patient, I can put on patience, is like a new thought. But that's who you are. That's what a lot of the New Testament letters are driving at. Put on gentleness, put on patience, bear with each other. Forgive one another if you have a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And listen to this, over all these virtues, put on love. That's agape. Over all these good things, over everything else, put on agape love. It's been born in your heart. It's your real nature, the agape love of God. In fact, it's so much your nature that the Bible says this is how we know we've passed from death to life. We've transitioned from the old, from, from death, spiritual death, disconnected with God to spiritual life connected with God. This is how we know, because we love, because we agape our brothers and sisters. That's, see, that's the acid test. And it's not the acid test in the sense that, oh my God, I, I, I really don't feel like I, I love people very much. Um, maybe I'm not a Christian. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that once you're born of God, you have that nature, but you have to learn to put on that nature and you can do that. And you can walk in agape love like you wouldn't believe by changing how you think. Now, in this closing few, few thoughts here, I want to touch on this, the power, I've called it the power of setting your mind, because you're going to see when we're talking about now walking in our real identity, you're going to see the enormous power, and there are lots of verses. I haven't got time for them all, but enough, enough. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Proverbs, as you know, says, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. We become what we focus our minds on. It's powerful. But listen to listen to a couple of New Testament passages, would you? Are you, are you all right with this? We're kind of going through the scripture a bit, but I hope it's helping you. Romans 8, 5 to 9. Those who live in the flesh, according to the flesh. Now, he's talk, writing to Christians, but he says, now, some Christians live according to the flesh, the fleshly nature, not the old nature that's died, the flesh that we walk in. The, the Greek word there is sarx. It's, it's, it literally means meat. You're living, you know, we live in the meat. <laughs> you're, you're, you're a piece of meat. I'm a piece of meat, and whilst ever we're on this planet, we live in the meat, and that meat has a certain influence, a certain pull on us. And whilst ever we're on the planet, we're going to have this influence because we're in the meat, because we're in the flesh, because that's that we're in this planet. But that's not the old nature. That nature died. That's a different thing. But the meat, the flesh, will put a pull on you and... You can live that way, and many Christians do. Listen, those who live according to the flesh, they have their minds set on what the flesh desires. They just set their minds on that. I want a new car. I want a new wife because uh, she's getting old. I want that job. Um, I want to treat people the way I want to treat them. I'm going to spend my money on whatever I want to spend my money on. And we're living completely self. Now, you can be a Christian and be that way, but it's not the right way to be. It's not the best way to be. It's not at all what Christ came to make you. So we we set our mind on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. What does the Spirit desire? That you walk in love. That you walk in kindness. That you walk in patience. That you have no fear. That you're bold and confident. That you have so much so much belief in people that you're unshakable in your faith. You keep your mind on things the Spirit desires. The mind that is governed by, focused by, constantly thinking on the flesh, is going to end in death. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. You can easily be a Christian and live without much peace and without much life just because you've got your mind on the wrong thing. The mind, the realm of the flesh, sorry, um, <clears throat> those who are in the realm of the flesh, you live according to that, you can't please God. Doesn't mean you're not a child of God, doesn't mean he doesn't love you. It means you're not pleasing him because you're living according to yourself. However, you're not in the flesh, but you're in the spirit, in the realm of the spirit, if the spirit of God dwells in you. So you're already in that realm, but you've got to learn to live according to that realm. Here's another one along the same line as we come to a close in this little section. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. So there's a fight, but it's not worldly. On the contrary, they have divine power, our weapons, to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's the war he's talking about. That's, that's the difference between living in the new creation reality, in the identity you have as a God-man and a God-woman, and not living there. It's all there. We have a fight. Okay, the flesh is going to pull on you, but it's not the weapons of the world. But we do have divine power and we can demolish strongholds. Strongholds are not getting on the highest tower in London and demolishing. This is talking, it's clear, it's talking about your thinking. We demolish arguments. Arguments come. Yeah, if God would wanted that. If God was with you, then why did that happen? If, if, if what Pastor Paul said about God's blessing was true, then that would never have happened. How come he prayed and that person never got healed? Or whatever. These are pretensions that set themselves up against the knowledge of God. Your job as a Christian is to take captive that thought. Say, no, no, no. No, no, no. We're not thinking on that. We're thinking on something else and making it obedient to what Christ said. Romans 12, 2, another passage, you can look it up. It says that our lives are changed or renewed or reupholstered, transformed by the changing or the renewing of our mind. We change the way we think. You've, as you get your thinking in line with what God said, and, you do, and it is a war, that we do have a fight. You've got to train your thinking to do it. It doesn't all happen for you. 
The power is there, though, as you make the decision to go in that direction. All right, I'm going to leave you. That's the end of session two. I'll be back with a different shirt soon. God bless you. Bye.